Okay, well, what a what a Torah portion. I mean, <laughs> you know, share on this portion. You uh, from chapter seven, we've been seeing the judgments of God on uh, poured out on Egypt. We had the plague of the the blood and the water turned to blood. Frogs, gnats, flies, livestock, boils, hail, and now we come to the last three. Um, this is a very foundational parsha. It's the uh, it's the parsha of redemption. It talks about Shem, uh, Pesach. Um and here there's something very interesting going on. Why it takes such a long passage of scripture is because it's uh, a, a turning point. It's a step change. And uh, last week uh, I was blessed by um, Josh's teaching, as I usually am. Uh, when he talked to us about how God didn't reveal himself as yod he vav he to, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And there's a problem there because we know that Abraham built altars to yod he vav he It says Abraham built an altar to Adonai. Uh, and you ably taught us, really, the difference. And I, I, I just want to mention it again. Uh Josh mentioned that that El Shaddai, El Elyon, these were the names by which he was known to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It's the way that God worked because he was a covenant-making God. He was making a covenant with Abraham. Abraham never saw the physical outcome of that covenant promises, the covenant promises that God gave to him. He was a stranger and an alien in the land that he owned, that God said, this is yours, this is yours and your descendants. So he knew the covenant-making God, and he believed in the covenant-making God. He had absolute faith in the promises of the covenant-making God, but he didn't see him acting as a covenant-keeping God, actually bringing these things into being. And that's where we are now. This is a step change in the cumulative revelation. That's another phrase I very much like, rather than progressive revelation. Cumulative revelation, because all of us, here are going through a process of cumulative revelation. I'm going to share a few thoughts, and I haven't set my watch on. I promised myself. Now be able to read. I yeah I <laughs> I promised myself a couple of things. One that I was not going to carry, start a rant about transgenderism and progressive ideologies, but uh, no, I'm going. I'm not going to. I'm not going. It's bad for my blood pressure. Or at least I'm promising myself. I'm going to try to keep it to 25 minutes. I don't want to, you know, what does they say? The mind can only take what the backside can bear. So we'll, 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 um, we'll, we'll try and make it um, short and sweet this morning. It's, it will be different. Okay, I, what I want to do is a little bit of a word study, take a few of the verses here. We're not going to get much further than the first couple of chapters and only a few verses out of there. But I want to share with you some thoughts that I had over the years and recently as I was studying uh, last week. Um, we can see here the cumulative revelation of his character and nature. It takes a giant leap forward. Okay, this is God doing something incredibly new in a sense. Okay, it's a new thing, the start of a new thing, the start of the creation of the nation of Israel. This is the birth of the nation. Uh, somebody once described Israel coming out of Egypt like coming out of a womb. Egypt was the womb. And when you think about it, it's quite a good analogy. They went into the into the womb very small. Um, I learned over the week, listening to some debates, uh, do you know what the word fetus means? The word fetus, the fetus in the womb. People keep talking about a difference between a fetus and a baby. There isn't actually any difference. Uh, a, a fetus is a baby in the womb and the baby is a fetus out of the womb. Fetus in the Latin means little person. Literally means little person. Tiny person. That's what fetus means. I don't know why I said that. I just pass it on. Um, doing something new, being born out of Egypt. That's what I was talking about. Okay, you have to forgive me. I, I'm, I'm not trying not to ramble, but I'm not doing it for a good job. Okay, so... The, the Egypt was the womb. They went in small, they grew up, and Egypt got to be a, you know, a place of constriction, of constraint, and then they burst forth in blood and water, and they're born out into the wilderness. I think it's a very good analogy, personally, but um, it, it's, it's, it does it for me. So the birth of the nation. 
Right. Just a little word of, uh, of, of clarification. I love words. I always have. Okay. I've always been a great reader, especially in literature, classical literature. Um, currently, my my favorite is um, uh, George Eliot, otherwise known as Marianne Evans. I find her writing incredible, the English, the, the phrasing. And when I first came to learn Biblical Hebrew and New Testament Greek, it was New Testament Greek first, and the first book I bought was Blaine's um, uh, Word Pictures of the New Testament. I was thrilling to know that the words in the New Testament have pictures attached to them to tell you what that word means. So words are important to me, I, I, and that's how I approach the Bible. I like to look at the words, find out what the words mean. So I'm going to do that. I did a little word study this morning on a couple of verses. A couple of things that I think have been translated, not incorrectly, but insufficiently, and I'll explain that as I go. Uh, and I must make, in all the, um, honesty, I must make a disclaimer. I do not regard myself as a Hebrew scholar. I have done correspondence courses on Hebrew and New Testament Greek. I have a basic working knowledge. I'm not a, I'm not a, a great scholar. I don't spend all my time looking at um, historical literature and all the rest like most do. Okay, so with that, with that done, the other thing I, I, I got to say is, and I'm sure Josh feels the same thing. One of the things is when you start to study to bring a word from the Bible to people. One of, one of the stages I go through is I walk away from it. About, you know, I get a few things coming and looking at different verses. And then I think to myself, who the heck am I to stand before people and expand the words of Almighty God? Who, who am I? That's a good place to be, by the way, because that's when God starts to speak to you. <laughs> it starts to show you things and he starts to enliven things to you. I'm sure Josh feels it as well. It's an incredible responsibility. So I'm going to share with you some of my thoughts. They might not be your thoughts, but they are my thoughts. I want to share them with you and a reason why I think they're important. And the first, I want to start at the very beginning of, uh, of um, Parsha Bo, and that is uh, with verse 1, because that's the beginning, chapter 10, verse 1. And it says, I'm reading from the King James the only reason I'm reading for the King James is that's what my study software pumps say if I do a copy and paste, okay? And I can't be bothered to go to Bible Gateway. But anyway, And the Lord said unto Moses, Go in unto Pharaoh, for I have hardened his heart and the heart of his servants, that I might show you these my signs before him. I'm going to deal with the elephant in the room at the end, okay? Um, but for now, I'll look at the word go. It's translated go. The actual Hebrew is Vayomer Adonai El Moshe Bo El Paro. Bo El Paro. And here it's translated go into Pharaoh. But but you some of you who've done a bit of Hebrew, heard a bit of Hebrew, what does the word bo mean when we say bo? Do you know? When we say bo Yeshua, what do we mean? Come. We mean come, not go. Now, you might think I'm being pedantic. Please stick with me, because I think it's important, okay? Go in unto fear. Now, just imagine, this is the difference between being sent and being invited. To say to Pharaoh, go, to say to Moses, go into Pharaoh, means he's being sent into Pharaoh. Now, I know God is omniscient, and I know God is everywhere, okay? And I know that I'm being a bit pedantic, but think of the difference between go and come. Come is an invitation. And remember that Moshe is, uh, this is a job he didn't want. You know, this is a, can you pick someone else? That was his, uh, you know, at the end of all the wonderful things God did with him in the burning bush, can you pick someone else, you know? Um, he really didn't want the job. And he has to go into Pharaoh now. Uh, well, this is before, I mean, world in the last three, but he's had to go into Pharaoh. But every time God has said to him, go, or bow. But what he actually said was, come. And it's almost like he's saying to to uh, to encourage Moshe, come into Pharaoh. I'm already here. I'm here. You come in and join me with Pharaoh. Do, 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 are you getting this? Are you understanding? This is an invitation. You know, God is always inviting us. He's always saying, bow. He's always saying, come. And so we can 
understand that wherever God calls us to be, he's already there in a, in a real and tangible sense. He doesn't call you to go anywhere where he is not. Now, I know you, you know, you'll come up with this wonderful you know, theological omnipresence. I know God's everywhere, but it's nice to hear it, isn't it? Come, come. It's an invite. Come in. Now, we'll see more of this in a minute. There's an interesting uh, verse in Ezekiel 48, verse 35. It was, uh, and this is talking about the city of God. But the last little phrase has become one of the compound names of God. And it says, it was around about 18,000 measures. The name of the city from that day shall be, and I just made it go too big. The Lord is there. Adonai Shama. And Shama in Hebrew is there. Po is here. I'm Po. That's Shama. Okay. So what God is saying is, I am always there. Wherever you go, I'm always there. Isn't that a wonderful thing to know that wherever you go, God will be an active presence wherever you go. That gives me great hope. Let me be pedantic once more. Uh, in Exodus chapter 10, verse 3, it says, And Moses and Aaron came in unto Pharaoh and said unto him, Thus says the Lord God of the Hebrews, how long wilt thou refuse to humble thyself before me? Let my people go that they may serve me. Very powerful, very uh, powerful word of command. But that's actually not what it says. Okay, that's how it's been translated. But what it actually says is that when you hear the word, you'll understand why I make the difference. Shalach ami v'yavide... Oh, sorry, um, I've got to get this a compound word. V'yav... Dune, and it really means send forth my people. So what's the difference you say and let my people go, send my people forth? What's the difference? Well, one is passive, the other is active. God is not just asking Pharaoh to, to passively release the people. He said, you send them forth. You, in your authority, send them forth. You've got to do it. Nobody else. It's not just sit back, you've got to send them out. You know, shalach, shaliach, it's an apostle, an emissary. So what he's saying is, send out my people like an emissary under your authority. You've got to be actively, proactively involved in sending my people forth. But what he's also saying, and, and I, I, I believe in, in saying, send my people forth, is he's actually saying, Okay, uh, just expecting some medication, Eddie. Now, this uh, pharmacist, so I fully understand. Okay, uh, let my people go, send my people forth. What he's saying, basically, is to be... Uh, yeah, he's, sorry, I've done that bit. He's given Pharaoh an opportunity to partner with it. And I think that's amazing. He's saying, be my agent, be my agent in bringing about my plans and purposes. Now, I know Pharaoh's hard-hearted and he's not going to do it, but do you understand what God is doing for Pharaoh here? He's actually saying, if you do this, you can actively partner with me in the creation of this divine, divinely appointed people. You can be part of this, Pharaoh. You can join in. And that was, that's going to come in a little bit later on when I deal with the other... It's not just a passive release, but an active use of his authority and command. And God is commanding Paro to actively co-partner in the Exodus. That's the chance he's given him. I thought that was amazing. You might think I've stretched it too far. It blessed me. And then I want to deal a little bit with... Um, I'm not going to deal with the plague of locusts. The, the, the three plagues we've got here are the locusts, the darkness, and uh, and the death of the firstborn. But I, I'm just picking up a few words, and I don't intend to do much more than that, really. And this is in Exodus 10, 21 to 23. And there's a couple of things here I want to just look at. And the Lord said unto Moses, Stretch out thine hand toward heaven, that there may be darkness over the land of Egypt, even darkness which may be felt. 
And Moses stretched forth his hand toward heaven, and there was thick darkness in all the land of Egypt three days. They saw not one another, and neither rose any from his place for three days, but all the children of Israel had light in their dwellings. Wonderful, wonderful bit of scripture. There's a, there's a darkness which may be felt, it says. Um, it's, a, it's sort of okay. It's, you know, it's, it's not a bad translation. People try to translate these things so they make sense in a target language. But what it actually says is, via mesh, Hoshech. Now, Hoshech is the normal word used for darkness. It's what was over the face of the earth at the beginning, Hoshech. It's also t- to do with spiritual darkness. But there's another word here, which also means darkness, which is Yamesh. But this means more of a, 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 of a spiritual darkness. It's a, it's a felt darkness. It's a groping darkness. In other words, there's absolutely no light. Has anybody here ever been in a place where there's been absolutely no light? I mean, completely dark. You out. What was that? Sorry? Big pit. Yeah, yeah, that's it. Yeah, that's it. You will, you will experience it if you go underground, if you go into a cave. I used to go caving. Don't laugh. I did. All right. Eighteen-inch drain pipes were no problem to me. Mind you, I smoke in forty a day, but that's that's is a long, long time ago. It was eighty. That's that's by way of a confession, not a not a boast. All right. That's what God saved me from. Uh, I used to go caving, and one day we were we were in a cave. Uh, in, we were practicing in the forest of Dean, actually, in the iron mines. And uh, the guy who was taking us, we went on ahead and said, we're going to join us later. And we were in this big cavern. And he, and he said to me, he said, he said, Steve, he said, turn off your light. And so I turned off the, the electric lamp that I had on and he turned off his. And I've never known anything like it. It's an incredible experience, isn't it? To be in the pitch black, not to be able to see a hand in front of your face. Nothing. And as at the time, I was a terrible sinner. I lit up a cigarette and it lit the whole place up. It was this just tiny bit of light on the end of my cigarette. It lit the whole cavern. See, light always overcomes darkness. Always. A small amount of light will overcome darkness. But anyway, I'm, I'm, I'm rambling. Let's not ramble anymore. And then it says that there was thick darkness. So it's felt, it's thick, it's not normal, not light. So even, you know, even that is awesome enough. But this is something else. Now, I am going to speculate a bit, okay? Uh, and I'm speculating based on the actual Hebrew text, okay? And it's where it says, neither rose any from his place for three days, okay? Okay, it's fine. But literally what it says, no man rose from underneath him for three days now hebrew doesn't have a neutral gender so you have to find out what the hymn is and the hymn relates to the darkness no one came out from underneath the darkness for three days there used to be a phrase in hebrew uh, if you met somebody they would say machadash you know what's new machadash and the answer was in in old hebrew days in old beginning when Hebrew started to become the national language, you would answer, Ein kol chadash tachat hashemesh. You would answer, there is nothing new under the sun. Now you just say nothing new, Ein kadash. But it's makadash, Ein kadash. But the full answer was, Ein kol kadash tachat hashemesh. Where's that from? Nothing new under the sun. Nothing new under the sun. So underneath means underneath. Now, is it too much of a stretch to think that these people experiencing this type of darkness, this spiritual darkness, were actually experiencing shale? Were actually experiencing a place underneath, where it's usually the Bible talks of being underneath the earth? I wonder. But I think the words probably bear it out. It's underneath something. They weren't, they weren't, they didn't come stay in their dwellings, they actually came out from underneath the darkness that they were in. The other lovely part of that that section there is that Israel had light in their dwellings. 
While all this was going on, God had made a difference. And that, I want to just speak a little bit about that difference because I thought it was the word have deal, but it wasn't. It was another word, but it means making a difference. It's not a difference between something and something else. God just made these people different. He just did something different with them so people could see that there was something about the Israelites. They were exempt from God's uh, uh, um, judgments, and the Egyptians weren't. Okay. Now I have to I, I have to put a caveat in because there are some very clever Egyptians who'd worked out something that if God was favoring the Israelites, they better do what the Israelites were doing, and they did. When in the one with the hail. They saw the Israelites taking our cattle indoors, which God had commanded them to do, and they thought, we better do the same. And they did, and our cattle were okay. So, uh, again, I'm going to address the elephant in the room in a minute. So these are the, these are the things that I was looking at in these, in these verses from the, actual, uh, from the actual Hebrew verses themselves. So what about the elephant? Well, it's my elephant. You might have this elephant in your room, but I've got it in mine. Or I had it in mine. I'm, I'm sharing you from where I was and the accumulative revelation to where I am now. The elephant in the room for me when I first came across these passages was, uh, was from chapter 4. Well, sorry, once in chapter 4, between chapter 7 and chapter 14. One phrase or a variation of it recurs ten times by my count. And that is the, the phrase that we see in Exodus uh, sorry, 4, 21 to 23. And then it repeats, as I said. This is a first occurrence. And the Lord said unto Moses, When thou goest to return into Egypt, see that thou do all those wonders before Pharaoh, which I have put in thine hand, but I will harden his heart, and he shall not let my people go. And you shall say to Pharaoh, Thus says the Lord, Israel is my son, even my firstborn. And I say unto thee, Let my son go, that he may serve me. For if they refuse to let him go, behold, I will slay thy son, even thy firstborn. So this is the first message that Moses would give to, to Pharaoh. And, he, and here's the elephant in the room for me when I first came across this verse 30 odd years ago when I became a new believer. If God hardens Pharaoh's heart, how the heck can he do anything other than have a hard heart? If God does it, if God hardens your heart, you're done. You know, it, it, it's a done deal. And, and he says and, and he says to me, oh, I'm going to harden his heart so you won't let my people go. But I thought that was the point, to let the people go. Wasn't that the point? Isn't God being unfair here? Isn't he being terribly unjust and unfair to Pharaoh. You see, there's a lot of people with this idea that God isn't fair. God isn't just. Now, my first cook port of call was to realize that I can't argue with what God does. God is sovereign. You know, if God hardened Pharaoh's heart, then it was right for God to harden Pharaoh's heart because he was righteous. Okay, it's just logic. Did do it, unfortunately. I still had this in the back of my mind, and I still I thought, okay, all right, I'll I'll just accept it. But then I was arguing with somebody one day about this, yeah, about the unfairness of God, and um, and I thought, well, I've got to look into this. You see, what chance did Pharaoh stand? Is this fair? And God says in one point, my thoughts are not your thoughts, and I don't mind ways your ways. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are the way, my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts your thoughts. So this is where you have to start. I can't ever understand totally God. You know, I, I, I'm, I'm someone here, it's like somebody once said about an evangelist. You know, uh, an evangelist is one beggar telling another beggar where to get bread. You know, we're all we're all looking and trying to find out. And But I, I you know, I, I needed to do battle with this. I need to get to the bottom of this. But there are a few things that we need to take into account. And I believe that it's only by reading what's there and rereading what's there and understanding what's there, and then we understand that there's nothing further from the truth. This is the fairest thing that God could do. 
Because there's another verse that keeps recurring throughout this section of Scripture, and it's the verse that says, Pharaoh hardened his heart, or he still remained hardened. Pharaoh hardened his heart. He had a hard heart to begin with. The interesting thing is when it talks about God hardening Pharaoh's heart, it uses a word that we are familiar with. It uses the word chazak. Remember chazak, chazak, benit, chazak, be strong, be strong and be strengthened. What it really means is to stand strong, to cause to stand strong or to confirm. So what God did was just confirm the state of Pharaoh's heart. He wasn't tampering with his free will. This is how Pharaoh wanted to be. I remember when I first read Romans chapter 1 and what an absolute eye-opener that was. You know, talking about the state of fallen humanity, talking about the world. And it, there's one sentence in there which really did not terrify me, but it, it made me see that this is deeply serious the most serious judgment that God can perform on any individual or nation is to give them over, is to let them carry on, is to say, okay, you, you want to do these things, you want to worship the crea creation more than the creator, carry on. God's silence is the worst judgment that we can have. When God stops speaking, stops warning, stops telling the people what's coming, that's the worst judgment that can fall. God's silence. He gave them over to a reprobate mind. He gave them over to 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 uh, to, to lust and all the all the other stuff. Read chapter one. It's astonishing. This is happening today. It's happening right now. God is giving people over to strange ideologies and saying, "Get on with it. See what you get, because it won't be good." So he just really, this is my first thing, he's really just strengthened Pharaoh in the way he wanted to go. And there is a verse in the Talmud that says, in the way a man wishes to go, he will be led. So be careful what you ask for, be careful what you want. Because it won't be God that's leading you in that case. God strengthened and conferred the normal state of Pharaoh's heart. And as I say, many other verses speak of Pharaoh hardening his own heart, having a hard heart. We've got to also consider Adonai's omniscience, his all-knowingness. The fact I'm on 25 minutes, so I'm going to have to finish quick. Okay. He, I, I struggled for a long while with, with predestination. But I, I suddenly found, I said to, to Josh one day, how the heck did I get to be a Calvinist? I couldn't remember becoming a Calvinist. I can't remember signing up to it, but I was. You know, I believed that God was directly responsible for everything. And then I began to realize, actually, God is sometimes indirectly responsible for something. I do believe that God has a permissive will and he has a perfect will. And if he can't get his perfect will, he'll work with his permissive will. And this is what he's doing with Pharaoh. He knew what it would take for Pharaoh to let the people go. and said so right at the beginning. Chapter 4, at the burning bush, Moses was told to tell Pharaoh that if he didn't let the people go, he would kill his firstborn son and the firstborn sons of Egypt. Okay, so right up front, God tells him this is what's going to happen. And one of the things I thought, well, you know, if, if that was going to make Pharaoh make them go, why not just cut to the chase? Why all these other ones? Why not just cut to the chase, get it done, and get them out? See, that's a difference between my thinking and God's thinking. <laughs> I, once, I, once, um, I once played somebody at chess um, at, at work um, when I was just qualified, and there was an apprentice came, and I was supposed to teach him about the heat treatment department. And he was a chess player, and he asked me, do you play chess? I said, well, very, very, not very good. And he said, okay. He said, well, would you like a game you know, in the lunch hour? I said, yeah, fine. And um, he said, uh, he said, I'm, he said uh, nails were a chess club. And so we had a game. We set up the board, and five minutes, I was done. 
And I thought, oh my goodness. Anyway, uh, I, I started to learn from him and I got a bit better. It got to be 10 minutes, uh, 15 minutes. And then he said to me, and it really deflated me because I thought I was getting better. And he said, would you mind if I turned to the wall and played in my head? And I said, well, no, I thought it would be an advantage. It was no advantage at all. He played the whole thing in his head, game after game after game, and he beat me every time. In fact, my only claim to fame is I, I actually got to the point where I lasted out the lunch hour. <laughs> the game lasted an hour. And if you've ever seen chess, you'll know it can go on for a long time. But anyway, why am I saying this? I'm saying this because a grandmaster apparently, uh, if I can find where I am, Yeah, a grandmaster can often visualize and evaluate complex positions. I got a, a bit of a confession. This is from ChatGBT, okay, with the chess player. I asked it how many moves a chess player could see in front of grandmaster. And they, and they said 15 to 20 moves in certain situations. They could see 15 to 20 moves in front. Can you imagine that? You know, if I move this pawn here, then the next one will go there, the next one will go there, the next one will go there, the next one will go, there, one will go right, so I'm going to do this. And then there's another set of 15 or 20 for that one. God is much greater than any grandmaster. He sees not only what was, what is, and what will be, but he understands what would have happened if. You remember Yeshua in, in Chorazin where he said, um, you know, if, if, if the miracles done in you had been done in Sodom, they would have repented in sackcloth and ashes. It would be better for Sodom in the day of uh, judgment than for Chorazin. He knew what would have happened if. That would have happened. If Yeshua had been in Sodom and he'd done those miracles, they would have believed. He knew that. So God's sovereign knowledge is important. But there's a few other things I want to look at. Why then all these other judgments? Well, God isn't just playing one move ahead. He's playing two or three or four million ahead, okay? He's, is, where can I put this? God's desire is that Israel comes out of Egypt, okay? That God's, God's plan is a plan of redemption for his people, Israel. You are part of it because you have been uh, saved by the Jewish Messiah Yeshua. You are part of that now. God's plan is redemption for Israel, that all Israel will be saved. One day they will all be saved. That nation at that time will be saved. But that's not all he was doing. He made sure that Pharaoh had ample opportunity to say, yeah, I'll let them go. I'll do it. I'll, 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 I'll join you. I'll, I'll partner with you. I'll do this. He wasn't going to do it, which is rather strange, and God knew he wasn't going to do it. But the point is, it's like justice in this country. We say in this country that justice must be done, and it must be seen to be done. Nobody could say at the end of this that God had not given Pharaoh every opportunity to repent. And he'd also made sure that he was uh, showing himself as Adonai, not just to Israel, not just to Pharaoh, but to the whole of the Egyptian nation. Remember the mixed multitude that went out, multitude, thousands and thousands of other races other than Israel went out with them because they got it. They understood. They got it. That'll be happening in the last days, by the way. People will get it. They will see that it is God that is sending his judgment. But here's a key. In Exodus 9.16, God gives his reason. And he says, in, in very deed for this cause I have raised thee up, thus Moses, for to show in thee my power. Oh, sorry, Pharaoh. This is, he's talking about Pharaoh. For to show in thee my power and that my name may be declared throughout all the earth. So he wasn't looking at just Israel and Egypt. He was looking at the whole earth was going to hear about this. Joshua 2, 8 to 11. And before they were laid down, she came upon them. This is a spies, okay, in, in, with Rahab. And before they were laid down, she came up onto them on the roof. And she said unto the men, I know that the Lord hath given 
you the land, and that your terror is fallen upon us, and all the inhabitants of the land faint because of you. For we have heard how Adonai dried up the water of the Red Sea for you when you came out of Egypt, and what you did to the two kings of the Amorites that were on the other side, Jordan, Zion, and Og, the other side of the Jordan, Zion and Og, whom ye utterly destroyed. And as soon as we heard these things, our hearts did melt, neither did there remain any more courage, in any man because of you. For Adonai, your God, he is the God in heaven above and in earth beneath. This is in Jericho, 40, nearly over 40 years later. Rahab is in absolute terror of the Israelites, so that my name will be known in all the earth. That was the purpose, that more people could experience the salvation of God, the God of Israel. That's his wonderful, wonderful purpose. And today, these Exodus events are celebrated and commemorated every Shabbat. Every Shabbat should be uh, uh, in commemoration of the Exodus from Egypt and the Moed of Pasach, when we every year celebrate this, this wonderful event, this, this start of the redemption of Israel. So I'm going to conclude, you'll be glad to know. What is the conclusion of all this? Well, I think it's very important. I think that it is about a hardened heart, the danger of a hardened heart. Pharaoh could have had the wonderful opportunity of joining God in the most uh, incredible piece of history, probably no, not ever. I mean, this is a cross, but it was immense. And he didn't. He could have been blessed. What do you think would have happened to Egypt if Pharaoh had said, yeah, I'm in. I'm in. I'll, I'll send them. I'll make sure they got enough to get across the desert. I'll make sure they get through the Red Sea. What would have happened to Egypt? It would still be great today. I, I, I would... I would... I would put it to you that it would still be great today. That was an incredible opportunity he missed. And why did he miss it? Because his heart was hard. He had a hardened heart that, that he wouldn't soften. He wouldn't be humble. He wouldn't listen. And one of the worst things that you can have in your life that will stop God moving in your life is a hard heart. I like um, the complete Jewish Bible version of Proverbs 4, verse 23, because some people are confused about it. It talks about the heart being the source of the issues of life. This is what um, David Stern translates it as, and it says, Above everything else, above everything else, guard your heart. Don't we have to do that in these days, brothers and sisters? Don't we have to guard our hearts? For it is a source of life's consequences. That's really good. The source of life's consequences. The borders of life, I think it says literally in the text. In other words, the outgoings of your life will be according to the state of your heart. Guard it well. Make sure you keep it light. Make sure you keep it from, uh, from this hardness. And I'm going to end with Hebrews 3, verse 7. This is by way of a warning to all of us. And to me, Wherefore, as the Holy Ghost saith today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts, as in the provocation in the day of temptation in the wilderness, when your fathers tempted me, proved me, and saw my works forty years. Wherefore, I was grieved with that generation, and said, They do always err in their hearts and they have not known by ways. So I swore in my wrath they shall not enter into my rest. Take heed, brethren, lest there be any of you in any of you an evil heart of unbelief, a hard heart, in departing from the living God. Guard your hearts. As my prayer that God would do just that for each and every one of us. That you grant us that we can keep our hearts soft towards God and strong against all the negative influences that rage against us. 
May God be gracious to us and may he help us to remain humble before him and know his strength and power in these last days. And may we see God making a difference with us in these last days. Bashem Yeshua HaMashiach. Amen.